today I want to talk about how AI power GX research streamlines the design process. I have to admit, I waited till the last moment to finish my slides, obviously because the rapid change of AI and not because I'm a procrastinator. So, before we start, a bit about me. Just heard it before, my background is in design, business, and engineering, which gives me quite a holistic view on product development. In my day job, I work as a product design lead for human-centered AI projects, and in addition to that, I'm mentoring early-stage startups as well as junior designers. So, the, part is structured, the talk is structured in three parts. We will first talk about the state of AI UX to get a sense of what's currently happening, some important terms. Then we will see, see what the future might hold. I have some predictions for you derived from the current developments. And in the final part, um, there is a case study. So I have some processes for you that teach you how to plan your AI project. And I will tell you about how I use that exact framework myself for a project that I'm currently working on. So let's jump in. The state of AI UX. So let's have a look what that exactly means. AI UX is quite a broad, quite a broad field, ranging from algorithm personalization to generating content. So that could mean anything from algorithmic personalizations that keep you glued to your TikTok feed in order to improve the UX, or it can pretty much mean the generation of any kind of content. So that includes research, that includes interfaces, and that includes code. We will focus on the latter for now, the generative AI. You're probably familiar with the most important tools. They are the most well-known tools, ChatGPT and MidJourney. There are tons more, and every day they are spinning up new ones. But as I said, these are um, like what the public perceives generative AI to be currently. So we just heard in the previous talks a detailed explanation of large language models, so I won't go into detail here. But what is important here to get like a, a common understanding of what an LLM is when we're talking about generative AI, because the terms are often used simultaneously. So large language models, or short LLMs, is a, are a type of AI algorithm that uses deep learning techniques and massively large data set to understand, summarize, and generate, as well as predicting new content. So that's very important to know for what is yet to come. The challenge, though, here is that LLMs are very powerful, and they are here to stay, but they currently lack the specific user interface to be really beneficial for whole workflows. So I guess most of you have tried ChatGPT at this point, and I think it's great to get like a sense of what it's capable of and testing things, but it's not really integrated into your workflows. And, and that's the issue, because you end up switching tools all the time, then you generate maybe a, a piece of content, try to copy that to your main tool, and it's just not the efficiency that we hope for yet. But the business potential for generative AI is huge, though. There was recently a, quite a big McKinsey study that estimates that generative AI will add $3 trillion to the global economy. The majority of the value, to be precise, 75%, is said to be within customer operations, marketing and sales, software engineering, as well as research and development. As you can probably tell, that means that generative AI has a huge potential to change the anatomy of how we work. To have a closer look at the design and research potential, I think that's, that's quite interesting, and that's what probably many of us here do on a day-to-day -day basis. I think it is very, or it can be very useful for things like market, market reporting, ideation, product solution drafting, and things like that. So it would essentially enable us to iterate quicker and better. And yeah, I, I think that's, that's quite exciting. and. Um, very curious to see how that turns out. So what it essentially means is that we will need to think or rethink how the world works 
and more precisely how the world designs, because we have so powerful tools now at our fingertips, and the only question is how we will integrate them into the workflow and how we will split the work that AI is doing and kind of what is left for us humans to do. I think many people are afraid, and we will, we will come to that in a second. Um, but at the same time, it's also very exciting of, of what is possible, and we will now have a look at some companies who are already working on AI UX tools. So first, on your left here, uh, we have Jamboard, which is a FigGem plugin, which was developed by the folks at Figma. And it's essentially a companion to your whiteboarding session. So when you have like your post-its from an ideation session, for example, it can cluster these post-its or summarize it, and it can even create new ideas, for example, based on your, uh, on your data. Then in the middle, we have Diagram, which probably some of you heard of. Uh, it was recently acquired by Figma. Um, what the Diagram team essentially is working on is they, they develop Fig, Figma plugins, and they try to automate the tedious parts of our work. So things like naming layers or applying various styles, things that take up so much time, are very repetitive, most don't really enjoy these types of things, and they want to automate that, so people like us have more time to work on the extra hard and interesting project. The team of Galileo AI goes a bit in a different route. What they at least promise, I think as of now it's a concept, it's not a tool itself, they promise to yeah, enable you to create interfaces only by typing in in natural language what you want the interface to be like. So that would essentially automate the part of the designer where like a client has an idea for a certain concept and what they want to do is that they kind of automate the whole path and um, yeah, it would essentially replace the designer in a sense like that. So based on the things that I'm working on for like the past years that I'm working with AI and the things that I'm currently seeing, I have derived some predictions for you of how I think that the future will evolve in that space, and I would like to share that now with you. In that context, I really like this, this quote here, we make our tools and then our tools make us. I think it perfectly captures the situation we're currently in with AI. It's like we're shaping the tools that we want to work with in terms of design, research, coding. And then these tools change our behavior, they change our day-to-day -day work. And I think it's, it's both. It's a, it's a huge potential for exciting new work as well as new roles. But there will definitely be change, and, and we now have the, change, the chance to shape how that should look like, how we want it to look like, because it will definitely have a big impact on us. So I very briefly touched on that already. I think many people these days are a bit, a bit afraid of, of change in general, or like how their specific role will change in the future if AI is set to replace them or like take away from, from the jobs or the, the tasks that we really enjoy. But I think you don't have to. I think one thing is for sure that our roles will change, but we won't lose our roles. So I try to summarize or like compare what humans do now or can do very well and where AI can support us. So. I think we as humans are still very good and superior at thinking, and the AI then executes what we think. So it's, it's rather an assistant and not someone who's replacing us. For the second one, we as humans curate or refine what AI has created. So if you use ChatGPT or Midjourney, for example, I think that comes quite naturally to you. So it's rather for creating a draft that you can then build on or refine. And it, it's really the role of, of an assistant and it cannot act autonomously yet. And the third part, I think that is very, very interesting because there's the huge potential in my, ear, in my mind of AI 
is that AI takes away these monotonous, repetitive tasks that no one of us is really enjoying, which then leaves space for us to focus on like, the exciting and novel parts of, of our job, which then can take even more time than it currently takes. So, regarding the predictions, I have brought three for you today here. The first one is, uh, and I briefly touched on that um, in, the, in the tool comparison, I think we will see natural language to interface design in front and based on design systems and generative AI rather soon. The question is how good the quality will be, but I think there will be at least some versions of it. Because if you think of it, if you have like a very well-maintained design system and you want to do like um, something mundane like a login form or like an element that has been used over and over before in your product, there might be some value in automating that and again here so that you can focus on the challenging parts, that you can focus rather on the what do we actually build and not how it looks like by just simply moving a button component to the right place. The second one is that I think we will see natural language to functional code. So even beyond like doing the, the layout work that I just described, and I think that could actually lead to the promise of no code where we democratize access to software development. That will be a bit more in the future, I guess. I think we will first see number one, but that will happen as well. And for the third one, which we will focus on a bit more now in, in the next slides. I think that autonomous AI will prepare, conduct, and analyze user research, or at least assist us with doing that. Um, and yeah, to, to summarize that, um, I think you get the idea that AI will redefine how product development is done in the future. And yeah, let's ha now have a closer look at how that looks like. So I promised you this, the case study is essentially about some processes that you can use to plan your AI project, and I'm showing how I applied it in a project myself. So here are some things to keep in mind to start with that I learned in the past years. The first one, start with a problem that only AI can solve. This is actually twofold. The first one is that you ensure you're solving an actual problem. And here we're ensuring that only AI can solve it because it will add complexity to your project, it will cause you headaches. So if there is an alternative to using AI, use it instead. It really saves you so much time and energy. The second one is a coin that I termed last year the double build measure learn loop. You're probably familiar with like the typical build measure learn loop where you build a prototype or a new feature you measure its impact and then you iterate, and you have the exact same mechanism for AI models. So you train them, you see how they work, and then you re refine them to ensure that they're actually doing what they should without any biases, without any hallucinations, things like that. And the third one, not less important, the need for cross-functional or interdisciplinary teams. Based on my experience, teams work best when they have at least these four roles. So this is business, design, engineering, and data. That doesn't mean that you need four people. Some people can unite these strengths in one, but it's very beneficial to have like, uh, a diversity of perspectives when you're developing new products and not only build, um, build teams solely of, of engineers, for example, or of designers or people who, who graduated from business school. So this is the AI incubation canvas, a framework that I developed to map a business case for AI projects. Um, as you can see here, we have 10 cards divided in three categories. The colors indicate who will work best on each category. So the yellow one would be part of the designer responsibilities, the red one is for the business people, and the purple one for data and engineering. I think the majority of it is rather self-explanatory, so I will focus on the purple ones, the data and engineering. The build or use card essentially means um, whether it's feasible to use an existing AI model or if you need to train your own to, in order to solve the, the problem that you want to solve with it. 
The fine tuning is about how you can adjust the model to perfectly adapt to your needs. And finally, the data logistics is um, where do you get your data from? So there you would list internal or external sources of where you get your data to either train or refine your model. So talking about the actual project that I'm currently working on, I would like to discuss the problem that I observed first. So a few months ago, I was tasked with doing some user research. I had to interview like a dozen people or so. So that means I, I did everything from recruiting participants, writing the research script, then having the interview where I mostly said the same things over and over again. Then I took notes, rewatched the recordings, and summarized everything. So quite a tedious and monotonous task. So there were definitely times where I felt like a robot myself because I was doing the same things over and over again. So I, I thought there had to be a better and more exciting way of doing this. And um, yeah, I set out with my best friend Max to discuss some possible solutions and explore how we can use generative AI to solve with that problem. And yeah, I would like to show that to you. So here's our vision for how such a tool can look like. Talking to users can be tedious. Preparing, scheduling, interviewing, and summarizing take up so much time. There's so much to learn, but you're always short on time and budget. We can do better. Meet UserFlix, your user research co-pilot. We leverage artificial intelligence to ensure you're building what your customers want without the manual work. Our vision is to automate user research. We're enabling product teams to learn faster and cheaper by scalable AI research co-pilots. Head over to userflix.de for early access. So that is what we imagine UserFlix to be like. If that sounds exciting to you, you can sign up for early access at userflix.te. Or if you want to join our product advisory board to get a chance to network with other AI and product thought leaders and join a community of people who are building the future, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can either find me on LinkedIn or scan the QR code here directly to reach out. And yeah, I'm happy to hear from you, and thank you so much for listening.